Get the stick. Get the stick. <laughs> There's no stick. I'm smarter. Any calls? You have no messages. Odd. Better check the outgoing. If you utter so much as one syllable, I'll hunt you down and gut you like a fish. If you'd like to fax me, press the star key. Hmm. Hmm. Oh well. Welcome to the 42 Podcast, where we discuss life together, looking for answers to life, the universe, and well, everything else. Here are your hosts, Rob and Lindsay. Merry Christmas! (laughs) Merry Christmas! (laughs) It's not hello, it's after Christmas, it's Merry Christmas, it's excited! There's wrapping paper and disaster all over the house. Hopefully all the kids are busy playing! (sighs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> they should be. Well, let me rephrase this. With what we got our kids, I'm busy figuring things out. Why? What did you get them? They're just upstairs. I can't say it yet. We're st- It's after Christmas when this is releasing, but it's before Christmas. Your kids are going to hear you if you say it right now? I don't know. I'm not risking it. Well, text me. Later. Oh, yeah, I'll text you later. It's some neat stuff. Cool. But, you know, you try and find what is the the kids' niche, you know, what they're into at that moment, and play up on that. But we also try to lean into that with the education side of things as well. Yeah. So it's not just, yay, flashy toys, but also, you know, things that they can use to learn. Yep. With what we got, my son, I've got a set of Raspberry Pi back upstairs, and or a small miniature computer, Raspberry Pi. Nope. Never heard of it? No. I use one for printing. I have another one down here that I'm going to be setting a new operating system on for him to use with what he's doing and huh. coding. Robotics? Did you get some robots? A coding. Heavy coding stuff. But he is getting a robot from someone at Christmas. I, look at this. Now you're getting me to snitch. Snitches get stitches. <laughs> Santa has no mercy. By the way, Mm -hmm. I did, I got and I did something that was really cool this week. Like, I never expected that this would be something I would be actually doing in my life. And it's a little, like, rabbit trail. Yes. But, uh, I got a Christmas card from Santa this week. Oh, that's adorable. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he, it's the guy that... We brought out to the church to do St. Nicholas. Yeah. And he does Santa, and that's his retirement career. Mm-hmm. So he and his wife, who does Mrs. Claus when he goes out to these things, sent me a Christmas card. And it was a Christmas card from Santa. That's cool. Yeah, it was. And then on on top of that, I was sending him a thank you card for coming out and helping with the event and, you know, really bringing a whole nother element and layer to our community outreach. And I sat down and was like, I just wrote a, a letter to Santa Claus. Because <laughs> that's, that's how I addressed it to him and, and to his wife, you know, dear Mr. and Mrs. Claus. And it was, I'm in my mid-30s and I just wrote a letter to Santa Claus. <laughs> oh, that's this cool. is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> It it was, it was, it is. So, and he was a great guy. Really enjoyed having him out. That's cool. Uh-oh, you're, you're writing. Why are you writing? I was just thinking of, like, who's my favorite Santa? Oh, which, like, which version of Santa? Yeah. My favorite Santa of all time is the Santa from the newer version of Miracle on 34th Street. Oh, I really yeah. liked him. Richard Attenborough. Oh, okay. He was so Jesus-y. <laughs> he was just so kind and patient, except for that time that guy was drunk. 
<laughs> and then that was Jesus C too, maybe. <laughs> it it has its elements. So yeah, I don't know. There there's that's a good question. Like what is the movie version of Santa that you like? That's a good thought. And then there's a Santa from uh Chronicles of Narnia. Remember? So when we were in that young adult program, mm -hmm. that was like, oh, we'll take everyone to the movies. Do you remember that? Yeah. And they took us to Chronicles of Narnia. I do. Yes. That was fun. They had us, you know, split up, you know, guy, girl, and we couldn't sit near each other. So I was in the back with all the guys and that scene comes up. And we've talked about this in the past with, you know, me and Santa and just kind of this love of Santa and the magic and mystery and embodiment of the spirit of Christmas, da da da, da all right? Yep. So when we're sitting there and that scene comes up, I'm doing the, the guy suck it in crime like, Santa! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not crying, you're crying. <laughs> uh, exactly. I'm sitting in the back, I'm like, oh my goodness, this theater is dark with Santa. Yeah. Because that's a really powerful scene. There's a reason why Lewis used Santa and brought that in. Yeah. In a story that is allegorical to Christ, where it's, okay, Santa is an embodiment of the spirit that is Christ born to us. And who better to give them their gifts? Who better to help them figure out who they were. But not only that, there's something else that that Santa does. He's just a marker on the journey to, in, in those books, in the journey to Aslan. Yes. He's a marker on that journey of, hey, keep going. You got it. Which is what Santa should be in the real world of... Yeah. He's just a marker towards why we give. Yeah. Which is always why I get a little, like, emotional... With good Santa moments. Uh, writing that letter to, to Santa, who came out and helped with the church. And just, he stood on our front porch at the church, ringing a bell, inviting people in, and inviting them to the house of the Lord. That was his language he kept using. Come to the house of the Lord where the gift of Christ is. That's cool. I just got goosebumps. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm standing outside like, don't cry. Don't cry. <laughs> don't cry oh forget it <laughs> but i mean he was he was a really good santa that's cool i think i'd have to go with tim allen's santa really that's interesting why because there's a bit of impishness to his santa <laughs> it, it's an invitation to every man being santa because how often do we blunder into or through something as as that embodiment and maybe because it speaks to that fathering side of trying to navigate that as well, and Santa, and you make mistakes, you blunder through it, but you're trying to just correct and, and walk the right path. That would be my gut read as to why I like it. Huh. I don't know, maybe there's another level deeper, but... My favorite part of the movie is the montage. It's not really a montage, but when he's being transformed into Santa Claus. Like, that's my favorite part mm. of the whole movie. <laughs> That's a fun part. Oh, 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 did you watch it this week? I forgot. Okay. Yeah. All right. This is mind-blowing to me. All right? Because I mentioned this to go and watch it, and we talk about it this, this week, didn't I? I did, yeah. And I said about Peter Boyle's character mm. in Santa Claus 2 and 3, he plays Father Time, right? Yep. I didn't connect this until last week when we were watching it as a family. Because it's Christmas, we're watching our family favorite Christmas movies. Mm -hmm. Peter Boyle is in the original Santa Claus. He is Scott Kelvin's boss at the toy company, huh. Free Santa. Yeah. He's at the beginning of the movie, he's in the boardroom, and it just kind of makes me go, wait a minute, did former Santa Claus begin arranging that he was going to retire be done and pass it off to scott kelvin and now father time is working with grooming and adjusting you know nudging scott kelvin towards huh. the path that would take him to be santa interesting i kind of always thought santa died though because he disappears um, so i just thought 
He died. I thought so too. But now that I have this, I'm just going to go with, you know what, he retired, he's in the Caribbeans, because Santa falling off a roof and dying is a bit dark, so this gives me an avenue to say Santa retired to the Caribbean. It's a bit 90s. (laughs) Oh, it's a very 90s thing. Yeah. But, yeah, I saw that, though, and just made that connection. I was like, yep, nope, that's definitely Father Time, not his real boss, and they're grooming him to become the next Santa. That's my theory. I'm sticking to it. Well, speaking of it, because we were talking about Everybody Loves Raymond, because he's in Everybody Loves Raymond. And the woman who plays his wife is in Mm -hmm. um, uh, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. She's in there. Oh, yeah. She's she's her mother, I think. Her mother? I, I don't know. I've actually never seen it. Of course, and I'm sure you have this really annoying ethical reason for why you haven't. My mommy didn't let me. That's I. You know, that's why I never watched it growing <laughs> up. That's why I never. Uh, Colby's the one who introduced me to it, and since then, we watch it every year almost because it's just fun. <laughs> it's just really funny. Yeah. So, uh, mom, I know you listen to the podcast. I love you. I'm just going to start there, and uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we, we weren't allowed to watch National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, and it's never been one there I've been like, oh, I need to actually go and watch that. It's fun. One of these years, I will, but... It's just classic. Chevy Chase is at his finest. The cast is yeah. really great. It, uh, one of the Quaid brothers is in it. Oh, yeah. The guy from Independence Day. Yeah. The brother that owns the RV and the fighter pilot, he flies up into the... <laughs> he's in it, and he's so good. You just He's so annoying. He's like this brother that shows up on his doorstep in this huge RV. Chevy Chase's character hates him, but the other character's too dumb to see it, to realize that they... <laughs> it's just really funny. It's, it's a good one. Let's see. But it's the only National Lampoon's movie I've ever seen, because honestly, it's not like a humor that I usually watch. Like, that's probably the chief reason I never watched it growing up, is my mom doesn't like that humor, you know, I guess. Yeah, my my mom didn't let me watch it. Just that wasn't the kind of humor we had in the house. Although, I got away with watching Monty Python Search for the Holy Grail Mm -hmm. all the time. Which is pretty crass. Yeah. I watched it... Years later, as a, when I was in youth ministry work, I was like, oh, I can never show that to students. <laughs> yeah. But I've seen a lot of other National Lampoon stuff that gets pretty raunchy. This isn't, there's, th- this isn't raunchy. There is a scene where he's flirting with someone at a store trying to buy lingerie for his wife. And uh, I think that's probably the reason that my, my dad wouldn't let us watch. It was probably that scene. I'll put it on my list of things to get around to watching. But I think one of my favorites is While You Were Sleeping with Sandra Bullock. Ah. I love that one. And Jeff Daniels. Ah. (laughs) This is one of my favorites. I just love Jeff Daniels. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh. Nope. It's not Jeff Daniels. It's not Jeff Daniels. It's Bill Pullman, who's also in Independence Day. That's so weird. It's like Seven Degrees of Christmas with Kevin Bacon. Okay, I was going to ask that in a little bit, about Seven Degrees. Have you ever played that? Yes. I I like that game. (laughs) I want to be good at that game, but I am not. Although I don't do it with Kevin Bacon as the end point. I do it just, you know, name two actors, and you have seven moves to connect them. I love that game, but it takes me a while. Uh, So Bill Pullman, who's delightful, I... I like Bill Pullman. And his hair is really good in this movie, too. (laughs) (laughs) Alright, alright, alright. Hang on. Which movie are we talking about? While you were sleeping. Thank you. Sorry, I'm trying to look these things up on IMDB while you're talking. I'm just, I was losing pace. Yeah, Bill Pullman, Sandra Bullock, Peter Boyle. Peter Boyle, yes! Peter Boyle. (laughs) That's funny. (laughs) 
apparently he's just going to be a reoccurring name on this uh, podcast today. Yeah. Which, by the way, I loved him in Young Frankenstein. Did you ever watch that? No. Mel Brooks, Young Frankenstein. Nope, I haven't seen it. Okay, you need to watch that. It's not a Christmas movie. Yeah. But it is a very good classic Mel Brooks movie. Oh. It is Frankenstein! (laughs) I'm just gonna shout that and leave it there. Peter Boyle plays Frankenstein. Oh, cool. He is a little... uh, Yeah. I love Mel Brooks. Melinda and I, years ago, when it came out on video, she and I sat down and watched The Producers. Have you ever watched it? Some of it. It's a musical, right? Yeah. Irrationally and unreasonably, it is one of the movies that has me just laughing and crying every time. Huh. I find it absolutely and utterly hilarious. I'd actually like to go and see the stage production of it sometime, but yeah. And that's Nathan Lane, Matthew Broderick, Will Ferrell's in it briefly, really? uh, Uma Thurman. Holy yeah. crap, now I need to revisit that. <laughs> oh my gosh, it is hilarious. And Uma... Th- <laughs> oh, Uma and her... Her her one song in there, flaunt it if you've got it. I again, I just I crack up. <laughs> and Nathan Lane is golden in that. I love Nathan Lane. Yeah, you you'll enjoy it if it's got Mel Brooks' name attached. I want to watch it. I do. He's he's a national treasure. We keep diverting away from Christmas movies. <sighs> what is like your one? have to watch or it is not Christmas Christmas movie ah uh, the Grinch the Grinch which, I, which Grinch the well the Jim Carrey one I like the okay. Jim Carrey one <laughs> honestly I don't I think I'm more about tradition than I am about the movies because like sometimes the movies are like I like the idea of watching it but when I think of having to relive some of the scenes or, like, watch it again, really, to sit down and actually watch it. It's more the idea than the actual movie, I think, because I don't like rewatching movies very much. So, hmm. I appreciate the movies, but I still, like, if I didn't rewatch it, I'd be okay. I wouldn't be too sad, too. It's weird. I don't know. I don't, I don't think I'm very sentimental. Hmm. If it's a good movie, I enjoy rewatching it. Now, uh, we rewatched The Grinch last night. How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Yeah. I will tell you what it is. It is always a good movie, but you always forget those moments that you know they fly over the kid's head, but land square in the adult's face. Mm. And that movie's got a bunch of those. Ah. Uh, Kiss it, Hoville. <laughs> yeah. And a few of those, I was just like. Oh, I definitely missed that the first time. Yeah. But that's a fun movie. I like the scene where um, Cindy Lou is interviewing uh, Martha May, and Martha May's getting all like, whew, a little hot under the collar and (laughs) getting a little flustered just thinking about the Grinch. (laughs) And uh, there's just so many good moments in that movie. (laughs) <laughs> Did you know that, uh, you probably yes. know this because you like trivial information just as much as I do, but I read that they had to have um, this g- guy come in to help Jim Carrey, like he trained Navy SEALs for a living, to help him cope with the pain and the torture that his like his eye makeup was causing him. That's like... Yeah, the intense. The guy was a uh, torture specialist and taught him how to endure... Yeah, that's pretty heavy. Yeah. And he's so funny. He's so funny. Oh my gosh. Uh, Jim Carrey was the perfect character to physically embody the Grinch. He he really was. I must stop Christmas from coming! But how? I mean, in what way? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he He was good. It was good. We watched that last night and just 
the kids laughed. We laughed. I fell asleep. I I was gonna say we were all sitting on the couch, so I mean it was that warm, yeah, it was that warm, cozy feeling. I was like, oh, this is a great move. Yep. I was out, but it was still good. Yeah. It's still good to build that family moment. Uh, I made Colby watch The Fourth Wiseman, which I told you about last week. About And like, I didn't watch. What if there was a fourth man that was supposed to go with the three wise men, but like he, he misses it. Like they leave without him, so he's trying to catch up with them. It's not a Christmas movie, really. It's more of a, it's really more of an Easter movie. But it was interesting in watching him just care about people and do exactly what Jesus would have done. I I will watch it this week. I will. It's a hazard of ministry. I this had to be the first instance of this had to be about a decade ago. But it it feels like this is something I've encountered at every single church I've ever been in, okay? Where at some point, especially around the Christmas season, it feels like we as a church get a letter that is, you know, not signed, no return address. Okay? Mm-hmm. So already, that's, uh, you know, that that's like a little bit mail? sketchy. Because it's not hate mail, but it is hilarious. And, and normally, uh, yeah, I just got to go through the front door on this one. It's a letter that is saying how theologically wrong insignificant and horrible we are because we have the three wise men in the nativity. Huh. And the three wise men would have been roughly about two years after the nativity moment in Bethlehem. And that's worth writing to your church every year at Christmas time? We don't get it every year, but it has been every church I have served at at some point Gets this nasty, like, how dare you? (laughs) And and it's a weaving argument of theology as to why we are absolutely horrible. And because of this one little thing, every aspect of our theology is wrong. That's bizarre. By the way, it's unsigned. It it is so bizarre. (laughs) Yeah, I feel horrible saying this part of it. But it's when we get those and they're unsigned, it's... Okay, well, there's nothing we can do about it, and no conversation we can have. It's just a one-way monologue that you don't want any input on. Yeah. So there's nothing. And, yeah, we are aware when the wise men come, they teach it to you a couple different times. And if we go by the church calendar, we don't celebrate the wise men's arrival until Epiphany. But yes, we do put the three wise men out at the nativity because it's part of the season. Yeah. Because if they were following the star, which appeared in the sky around the time that Mary and Joseph were traveling from Nazareth to Bethlehem, from Iraq or wherever, it took them two years to get there or two years to raise money for their trip and go. Yeah, that makes sense that they wouldn't be there that night. (laughs) Right. And theologically, it's not something that we, you know, stake any kind of hill to die on. It's just, yeah, we put them out. So what? Guess what I found Uh on Disney Plus? Uh Uh-oh. What? 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 There is this movie on Disney Plus. It's in the holiday section. It's called The Small One. And it's about a donkey. And the animation is almost, it's like they stole... A lot of Mowgli animation right out of the Jungle Book. Like, like his, like scenes where he like leans against the tree and then slides his butt down and pouts with, um... You do realize that Disney reused... I know, I know. ...a lot of animation. Yeah, but it's just... Like Christopher Robin and the scenes of Mowgli, there's almost a one-to-one outside of the character difference. So they could have. Right, it was just funny. It was just funny to see... And it was cute and about this boy who his best friend is this donkey, but his father can't afford to feed it anymore because the donkey's kind of useless. It's too little to do the work of the bigger donkeys. So he tells his son he has to go find it a home in Jerusalem and nobody will buy the donkey. 
It's really sad. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of a weird ending. Like, it's a weird ending. I was disappointed. I was hmm. hoping to see baby Jesus sometime. But there was no baby Jesus. It was really weird. Yeah, I mean, that setup. It's uh, You started making it feel like there was going to be a baby Jesus, but... There was a Joseph. Ooh. Joseph bought the donkey. Mm. But they just like... Oh, okay. They're just like, bye donkey! And the donkey goes away. Okay, well, that that still fits. I mean, that's playing into the story. That's yeah, letting but like, you... But, yeah, but I just felt like, I, I want... You want completion. Yeah, yes, I want the boy to follow them and... And then see the baby and, oh, look, and now maybe he has a friend or, I don't know. I don't know. It was just like he's all by himself in the city of Jerusalem, really far from his house. All by himself now, watching the donkey go away with Mary and Joseph. It was like, very uh, unsatisfying ending. Okay. I like baby Jesus. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I love, and it's, it is the, I have to watch. Or it's not Christmas. Mm -hmm. A Muppet Christmas Carol. Yes! Agreed. Agreed. Michael Caine as Scrooge. Oh. Yep. You can judge an actor by if they've been Scrooge. Mm -hmm. And if they've done it well. Yeah. Because who else has done a good Scrooge? It's not my favorite Christopher Scrooge. Plummer. But, um, Christopher Plummer. He was Scrooge? Yes, in the movie. It's a very new movie. It came out in 2017. And it was called The Man Who Invented Christmas. It's on Hulu. It was about Dickens' process writing The Christmas Carol and why he had to write it. Hmm. So he's like in his room and he's writing. And Christopher, for, blah, 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 Christopher Plummer is like his apparition of what Scrooge looks like. So Christopher Plummer is, this, is just there in his room where he's writing and they're having conversations and Christopher Plummer is so fantastic that you don't even realize until the end that that he's not even using a British accent and everybody else is but it's not out of place at all because he's so good you're just like yes you're Scrooge you're absolutely Scrooge wow and I'm reading the book right now too for my book club that it's based off of and it's absolutely not as good I loved the movie I'll have to check that movie out, because that does look good. Oh, and watch it with I, Melinda. Watch it with Melinda. She'll like it. Okay. So I looked it up on Google real quick. Jim Carrey played Scrooge. Yes. And I entirely forgot about it. And that's entirely dismissible. Disney Plus. Actually, I... He was... He was okay. I didn't like it. I didn't like their... The spirits. I did not like the Ghost of Christmas Past. I thought... It was super weird. Uh, weird. He was like a candle. He was like a fire. I didn't get it. I didn't like it. But Jim Carrey was delightfully Jim Carrey, you know? So he was, he's always fun to watch, but it, it, yeah, that's not. Plus it was like scary. Like it's not something I would watch with my kids at this stage of their life. It was like weirdly gory and not gory. Gory is way too strong a word, but like skeletons and creepy crawly stuff. Which I'm okay with a degree of ghoulishness is maybe the best way to phrase it around Christmas. And I guess I look at that because there's this overshadowing, like Christmas is beautiful. I love Christmas. But it's immediately followed by Easter. Have you ever seen the skit guys? Yeah. So you know who I'm talking about? Yeah. They did a skit. And it's the first time I've seen it this week, because I was doing some research for something we're doing at the church. And they did a skit of, it's like a whole minute long. I don't remember what it's called. I'd have to go back and find it in my notes. But the premise is, it's two guys standing around decorating a Christmas tree. And they're talking. And the one guy only associates baby Jesus with Christmas. Yeah. And as they're talking, he connects that, wait, baby Jesus is the Jesus of Later on in New Testament, he's the Jesus who's doing all these teachings. And the other guy's like, yeah. Wow. And then the conversation keeps going. And it goes, wait, baby Jesus is the one who died on the cross, baby Jesus? Yeah. Wow. And 
each level of it, they kind of keep escalating that, yes, this is the Jesus all throughout Scripture. They're making fun of how some people don't connect that. Yeah. And how there is the shadow of the cross that looms over this time. I love it. I celebrate it. But I can't remove that shadow. Nor should you. Right. And I guess that's where I, I kind of look and go, eh, you know what? It's okay to have these elements because Marley and Marley and the Muppet Christmas Carol terrified my kids when they were little. Yeah. But it's that's part of the point of Christmas. We are set free from death. Or at the beginning of it. The beginning of that journey. Why are you looking at me that way? You terrify me. Well, if you want ghoulishness, there is a Christmas Carol. It was like a television series, kind of. It was really long. It's kind of like a Christmas Carol if it was rated PG-13 or maybe even R. And it's got some swearing. And Guy Pierce is Ebenezer. Andy Circus. Ah! Andy Serkis. Hmm. I love him. Yeah, it's really interesting. And oddly edgy. Like if the, like a Christmas Carol, but edgy and, and actually scary. Hmm. Yeah. It almost seems sacrilegious, honestly, because it's like a Christmas Carol. It's kind of pointing to Jesus in a way. It's And it was just sort of made it kind of... Dickens, whether he intended to or not, points to Christ, but not... Directly. Not overtly, and I think that's that's nice. I think that's nice. Well, and I think that's part of the reason why A Christmas Carol is as successful, because it's it's that element that you were so aggravated in the, the little one or the donkey movie, where it lets you complete in the puzzle pieces and go, Ha ha! I know the rest of this! Mm. B- by the way, the Guy Pierce Andy Circus Christmas Carol, it's on Hulu and it's on Amazon Prime, too. So if you wanted to go watch that, it's really different. And I think I need to finish it because I, I didn't actually finish it. It was a little weird. <laughs> hmm. I'm such a baby. <laughs> yeah, you're funny with movies. I am. I'm weird. <laughs> That's okay. That's part of the fun of this, though. So. Or like, OK, so I don't know if this happens to you. Probably not. but. I'll think during the day, oh, I'm so excited. I can't wait to watch a movie tonight. I wonder what I'm going to watch. There's an Emily Blunt movie I want to see, but I have to pay for it. (laughs) And then nighttime comes. Colby actually goes to bed because he doesn't really feel good. And I am sitting in front of the TV. And I end up watching The Great British Baking Show because I have no idea what to watch. (laughs) And then I'm mad at myself for not watching a movie. No. Just me. Yeah, that's just you. Plus, it's like 8.30. I can't start a movie at 8.30. <sighs> but then I watch that. I watch the Great British British Baking Show until 10.30, 11 o'clock. So what's the difference? Why don't I just watch a movie? I don't know. All right. Can I ask you a question? Weirdly personal. Forgive me for this. Oh, boy. What time do you go to bed? Ha! <laughs> um, I usually am in bed by 9.30 because I'm up at 4.30. Hey. So. Okay. Yeah, but I stayed up really late last night. I was up till 11.30 because I found um, Lost in Space on Netflix came out with another season, the last season, and I'm really enjoying it. So I watched two episodes of that. I really like that. Oh, you're not done with it yet? No, I'm not done. I'm only on episode two. I've been I've been waiting because guess what? I don't want it to end, so I haven't watched it. I, I'm finally watching it now. Oh, it's it's so good. Oh, I, I love I love that show. Really good movie, or really good show. Really enjoyed it. I've been waiting for that season because I want, I wanted the story completion. And I love what they did with it. Good. I'll leave it there. I love the 1998 Lost in Space, and I think it is a drastically underrated sci-fi movie. Yeah, I liked it. I liked Penny. Gary Oldman is Dr. Smith. I mean, come on. Yeah. Is it... Yeah. And he, he, I love him when he's a bad guy. Me too. Really do. What did I just watch? Uh, the sixth, ele- uh, the sixth element. Isn't he the bad guy in the sixth element? His hair. Yes. His his costume in that movie was amazing. Yeah. Um. You, did you ever watch? We've gone off Christmas movies. Did you ever watch Leon the Professional? It's on my list of movies to watch on Netflix. It's in my list because it's like Natalie Portman's first movie. It it's a good movie to watch. It's very dark. 
Lolita ish. Hey. How Lolita ish hey. is it? I'm kind of afraid. I've never seen Lolita to say, so. Do you know the, the premise? It's like weird no. pedophile stuff. It's like kind of weird, but it's really a classic book. Everybody calls it a classic, even though it's about a pedophile and it's disturbing. But like, I don't know. I'm, not, I'm sure that's not a reflection on what people, but like why they, I just, it feels Lolita-ish. Okay. I'm never going to watch Lolita now. Uh, there's, yeah, don't. there's like one element of there that's in there. It's very one-sided. Uh, and it's very much Natalie Portman wrestling with how she feels, the savior complex from oh. Leon saving her. Oh. Uh, but then her also using that as kind of manipulative, hmm. not with Leon, but outside influences and that gets them in trouble. It's good. Hmm. It's worth watching. There's nothing where I was like, ooh, that is really weird, weird. But it, it was not a bad movie. Anyway, I bring it up because Gary Oldman is the bad guy in that. Hmm. And he's like pure psychotic bad guy. Like, it is the best bad guy I have ever seen him bad guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Good to know. So, Gary Oldman as a bad guy. Love him. Also love him in a serious black. Yes. Sorry. My mind just that. like, what? Yes. He was the perfect serious black. He was. Mm -hmm. He He's a great actor. I really love him. He's like John Hurt category of actor for me. John Hurt? Oh, yeah. Yeah. John Hurt. Yeah. But, um, who was the guy who was in The King's Speech? Is that Gary Oldman? No, that's... Who is that guy? That guy's really good. Um, Jeffrey Rush. Okay. Colin Firth. Oh. No, no, no. Colin Firth is Colin Firth, but Jeffrey Rush is, a. Uh, the speech therapist, I really like Jeffrey Rush, and I confuse him a lot with... Gary Oldman. Yeah, I don't know why. They look nothing alike, but for some reason... I like Jeffrey. Sorry. <laughs> so, because we are supposed to be talking Christmas movies... I can movies, just edit this all diverted. out. No, 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 no. Leave it in. Leave it in. <laughs> Leave it in. It's still worth the conversation. Because it gives us a great segue into the great debate... Is Die Hard a Christmas movie? I think it depends what you how you define <laughs> Christmas movie. How do you define Christmas movie? How do I define it? Mm -hmm. It is intentionally about Christmas and there are no hostages. People define Die Hard as a Christmas movie because it takes place at Christmas time. And there are hostages, and it's a Christmas party that gets taken hostage, so therefore it's a Christmas movie. Uh, no. It's a movie that takes place during Christmas, but so isn't Lethal Weapon. Lethal Weapon takes place during Christmas as well, and nobody ever calls that a Christmas movie. So Notice I said, no hostages. When you add in no hostages, weird, it is a Christmas movie, go away. I don't understand. Actually, I can't wrap my brain around what you're saying about the hostages. I don't understand. If there are hostages in the movie, it's not a Christmas movie. If someone goes and takes hostages, it's not a Christmas movie. So it's not about Christmas. If there are hostages taken. Does that make sense now? Mm-hmm. Because now the, nar the narrative is all about the hostages now. Nothing to do with the season. Yeah. I don't really like the definition of Christmas movie, though. Because I get what you're saying. But I get what other people are saying, is that, <laughs> like, you wouldn't watch a Christmas movie in July, it wouldn't be the same. You watch Christmas movies in December, because it, it's like, oh, this is Christmas, yay. So in that sense, in the fact that every single Die Hard movie, I think, takes place at Christmas time, but, again, I think Lethal Weapon does too, so. If you define a Christmas movie by a movie that takes place during Christmas, then yes, Die Hard is a Christmas movie, but does it cherish the spirit of christmas <gasps> no my favorite part of that whole movie guess what it is <laughs> hmm. when he's digging his toes into the rug <laughs> oh i think that's my favorite part of the movie because he's the most human in that moment <laughs> and the rest of the movie is just loud really loud so here's my story about die hard <laughs> and christmas one year a couple years ago I made the great mistake of watching that movie on Christmas Eve with Colby. 
and mm-hmm. oh. I sort of halfway fell asleep, but not deep enough. So I just kept being super disturbed by all this gunshots and explosions, but I couldn't really wake up all the way. So I was just, it was just highly disturbing and <laughs> it's very upsetting. I wasn't really upset, but it was very annoying and I'm never, ever, ever watching that movie again. Does Colby <laughs> hold that it's a Christmas movie? I think so. Yeah. Okay. So I heard this. I don't know if it was a voice actor doing this and sounding like Bruce Willis or if it was Bruce Willis because I haven't been able to find it on a secondary source. Mm -hmm. But apparently Bruce Willis' thought on Die Hard being a Christmas movie is it's not a Christmas movie. It's not an action movie. Insert a series of expletives. It's a Bruce Willis movie. (laughs) <laughs> that does sound like Bruce Willis, <laughs> from what yeah. I know about Bruce Willis. <sighs> so, which I entirely agree with. I enjoyed Die Hard the first time I saw it. I was, th- I think I was like 12 when I saw it for the first time. I was like, oh, okay, I like this. This is cool. Things are blowing up. Yeah. And, you know, you get introduced to Alan Rickman yes. as a bad guy. Alan! Yep. Which, again, let's just admit, if there's a bad guy to be a bad guy, it's Alan Rickman. He has his accent in the movie, right? He has his British accent in the movie? I think it's supposed to be more Austrian in the movie oh, okay. than okay. English. But he's he's got a an accent he does. It's but again, it's it's Alan Rickman. He's really good. Yeah. I love Alan Rickman. He's the Alan reason Rickman, why Tim Curry. Sorry, I was listing the bad guy bad guys. Like the guys who do really good deep voice evil bad guy. Tim Curry. I liked him in The Three Musketeers. He's the Cardinal. He's really good. Yeah, I don't remember. I I know I've seen it. I don't remember it. I love that movie. It's one of the movies I grew up watching a lot. Mm. So I love it and defend it to the death. (laughs) It's actually kind of hilarious when you think about Tim Curry as a Cardinal and then Tim Curry as Dr. Frankenfurter. Is that the Rocky Horror Picture Show? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's not, he doesn't act very Christ-like at all in The Three Musketeers. Well, I know, but it's just, yeah, it, it's just the, the contrast <clears throat> difference in dress that, yeah, that has me going, ha, huh, it feels weird. Cardinal robes against yeah. Dr. Frankenfurter's outfit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it, again, he, he is really good, really versatile, and he's got that very Alan Rickman, Tim Curry, uh, and there was someone else I was thinking. They just have, like, those bad guy voices. Oh, uh, oh my goodness. John Malkovich was a good bad guy, too. He is a good bad guy. I'm entirely blanking, and I'm going to feel really ashamed. James Earl Jones, there it is. He's got, like, the perfect bad guy voice. Of course, that's also because he's Darth Vader. What's the look for? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> You're right, James Earl Jones, yeah. <laughs> but when he uh, it, when he's not the bad guy, you're like, wow, that's like the perfect voice. It's Mufasa! Ah, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I have many confusing thoughts Me about too. James Earl Jones. Yes, I feel very conflicted about his voice. So, you have a twin sister. Your feelings have now betrayed her, too. Obi-Wan was wise to hide her from me. Now his failure is complete. If you will not turn to the dark side, then perhaps she will. Remember who you are. You are my son. And the one true king. Remember who you are. Are you good? Are you bad? You're chaotic neutral. That's what you are. Chaotic neutral is the worst because they just want to see the world burn and laugh and enjoy it the whole time. So have we settled the diehard debate? Yes. Of course not. (laughs) Yes. Diehard is going to be what it is to every person who watches it and whatever. It just comes back to your definition. You have to define. I think Voltaire said, if you want to debate me, define your terms. Oh, you used that early on in in the podcast. 
trying to nail me down on debates, and it's okay, fine. My terms are, I'm a chaotic neutral. Let the world burn. You are but not. You, you can't be a chaotic neutral and cry about Santa Claus, so that's <laughs> bullcrap. Baloney! <laughs> you have never seen me cry about Santa Claus, so you don't know. In your dreams. By the way, please don't text my wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Book club. Mm. We gotta talk book club. We said we were gonna do the Goodreads things in the new year, remember? I think Goodreads should be used mostly for keeping track of the books we want to read for book club, the books we've read for book club, and the books we're currently reading for book club. And our challenge should be book club books for the year. So one a month or something. Okay. So going into the new year, I think this is the first episode where let's let's talk through Dark Knight of the Soul. Yep. And let's lay out everything with book club, kind of what our goals are, what our thoughts are, and some of what we're looking forward to reading in the new year. Yeah. So where are you at with the Dark Knight of the Soul? I just started it. Okay. Like chapter, introduction. Chapter one. Okay. I knocked it out in a day. <gasps> Fine. Well, I'm not going to knock it out in a day. <laughs> it was a four and a half hour listen. Oh, well, I'm, 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 I need a pen and a highlighter and notes, so I'm not listening. I'm. Well, now here's the thing. This is why I'm saying this. I've ordered the book. Because it was, okay, I need to go back through this. I'm, I'm going to physically read it once and listen to it one more time, I think. Cool, yeah. Over Christmas, because it was one of those books where it's okay, I, I do need to have pen, paper, and highlighter, because they're, I like it. I have some thoughts on it. But I, I like the premise of it. I like where he's going with it. And if I can get Melinda to, I'd love for her to read it as well. And give her input and perspective. I'm not sure she's going to be able to. She's, you know, it's it's final week. But if she can't, I have a friend who might. Because my friend is the one who told me about this book. And she is a, a strong adher adherent of marrying spiritual formation with psychology. And she's pretty cool. She's a pretty interesting person. So if Melinda's not available, I thought we could maybe have her on at some point. I'm not opposed to it. Spiritual formation. And, and I think that's part of where I struggle with this book is the language he uses. Is the language of a psychologist or psychiatrist. He's a psychiatrist. And that's not language I'm good or familiar with. Yeah. And so there's a part of me that at times feels there's a tension between what is the theological and what is the the psychological and so his language isn't bad i just i feel like there's a muddy space in the middle that i'm not understanding as clearly as i think i should cool well i'm I'm looking forward to getting into that with you yeah well and that's that's again why i want to reread it and i i've ordered a physical copy because it's okay i i need to be highlighting by the way for a reference there's this podcast that i listen to called bridgetown church and one of the episodes they, they take two episodes actually to talk about the dark night of the soul and they refer to this book and this book is a, mm. uh, they refer to this book on their like church book club their church book store thing so i highly recommend listening to that because it's an interesting perspective and like there might be things in this book that we disagree with but the the pastor guy does an interesting job fleshing it out and uh i found it extremely helpful so bridgetown church dark night of the soul it's in two parts if you listen to it let me know because that'd be cool and that's part of a series actually called um name your stage of apprenticeship which i devoured and loved so i highly recommend listening to that whole whole series yeah i think it's going to be a really good conversation because he does lay out a lot of things. There's a lot of 
spiritual formations. And again, this is where I look and I feel inadequate because it's their spiritual formation things that he's touching on from a psychological perspective. And I run into a blank space on that psychological perspective. Hmm. Because my approach is always from that spiritual perspective. And so when I dip into the psychological, it's always from a spiritual view. It's always twisted with that. And that's where I feel there's conflict. Not in a bad way, but in a, I need to understand a little bit better. Mm. And with the counseling and that, that side of things, again, I lean on Melinda because this is her area of study. So she can help translate some of that. Mm. But... I think he's got some really good points. I think he's making good connections. I don't always agree with his language, but I think it's really good. Cool. So I, I'm looking forward to talking further with you about that. And we're doing, this episode would be January 10th. Okay. Because we're taking next week off. That's right, yeah. Which means there will be no episode on January 3rd. Yep. And we'll be back on the 10th. Yep. So, hey, happy new year to everyone. We will see you in 2022. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. Um, oh my goodness. I, I never remember them all, but happy whatever it is that you celebrate in this time. Thank you for listening. Yeah. All right. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. All right. We'll see you next year. Thank you for listening to the 42 podcast. Please take a moment to like and subscribe. And if you want to join in on the conversation, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter to add your voice to the conversation. Thank you.